Tara, I'm really excited for this interview today because all the topics we're going to be talking about are really near and dear to my heart. So I just want to set the framework for the talk today. So you know the questions will be concentrated on the three levels of our conscious, subconscious and unconscious mind. Apply it on your work throughout your life, including your childhood environment. The aim of this interview is to recognize the intersection between childhood environment and behavior, as well on our choices and experiences later on in life. Where were you born and where did you grow up? The house that I grew up in was, I grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, which is, is not the countryside, but it's a suburb. I mean, it's a bowling and um, like uh, sort of um, too much. This house wasn't like that. It was, it, it, it was what would now be considered a, a pretty simple, but um, quite beautifully thought out mid-century modern house. Okay. Um, and uh, in a way, you could say it gave a little bit of the feeling of the countryside because the facade that faced the street was pretty opaque. Um, and then, but the rear facade, which opened into our yard, was totally transparent. Um, and had, if we had this very private backyard, you couldn't see any other houses. Um, and, um, it was, it was actually a very unhappy childhood for a lot of different reasons. My parents had a terrible marriage and so on and so forth, but, but the house was still a refuge. Um, and, um, and there was plenty of space for us all to kind of just be who we were in different spaces. Exactly. Um, and um, there was a lot of wood inside the portions were beautiful um the materials were all natural now on the ground floor there were sort of stone floors with carpets and stuff like that so how old were you exactly well we got back from caracas uh when i was five okay and so and i lived there until um we all lived there until I went away to boarding school and then my parents sold the house. So that was when I was like 13 and a half. Um, but I should say, I'll add, since again, you know, I never talk about myself and my childhood, so it feels weird to do that, but you're asking me to. Why um, do you think it feels weird? That's a good question. It's so particularistic, you know? Um, I mean, it's just like, it's too much about me <laughs> anyway, um, but I'll continue. Um, Please. so, but the other part of this is that my father had grown up when he wasn't traveling and on the French Riviera and all these other cool places in this tiny, very picturesque town in Vermont, okay. um, woods when through an optical illusion, the moon looks absolutely enormous ah. on the horizon and has this kind of orangish, pinkish, yeah. yellowy tone. But I mean, huge, huge. And uh, the first time I ever saw a harvest moon, I was standing in a field at the farm and there was the, I mean, it really looked like it was gonna crash down right in our yard it was so big was this your first uh, you could recall it the first uh, feeling of awe that you were in awe um that's well, funny you ask that i'm really interested in awe actually it's some um, <laughs> um the first i don't know if it was the first but uh it was one of the early experiences for sure like my whole childhood during the summers i walked around barefoot through the whole town and there everybody knew who you were um and my, i was always norm williams's daughter anyway there was a river running through town we used to go jump in the river and 
finally, final component of this, my father's parents had bought, I mean, totally crazy, but even though they lived in this town of 1,100 people in Vermont, mm -hmm. in the Green Mountains, they bought a farmhouse five miles outside of town, which ownership of which my father shared with his sister, which was like this tumbling down, nobody really wanted to invest a whole lot of money in it, but it was on 200 acres uh, with views looking out over the whole state of Vermont. Wow. Um, and um, so I guess you could say I sort of did grow up in the country as much as I didn't, right? Um, <laughs> um, you get emotional when you remember this, when you have these memories coming to you? Um, do I get emotional? Yeah. Yeah, I, know. I guess so. Then we all get. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, childhood memories are so potent and, um, you know, the grooves, um, like really stuck um and they and they continue to form an important part of the way that i think about myself i guess uh, so i thought about this a lot because woodstock was the kind of town where like my whole childhood during the summers i walked around barefoot through the whole town my parents had a terrible marriage and so on and so forth but but the house was still a refuge, um, and um, and there was plenty of space for us all to kind of just be who we were in different spaces. Exactly. Um, and um, there was a lot of wood inside. The portions were beautiful. Um, the materials were all natural. You know, on the ground floor, there were sort of stone floors with carpets and stuff like that. So how old were you? Exactly. Well, we got back from Caracas uh, when I was five. OK. And so and I lived there until um, he my father was much more political than I am, although I'm like more political than a lot of people who are interested in architecture. But um, you know, it was through like all this travel and him talking to me and my mother too, um, that I realized like buildings weren't just these inert objects. They, um, they incarnated politics and they incarnated history. Um, I mean, particularly for my father, they incarnated politics because the built environment was the way in which social injustices were perpetuated. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was what he devoted his life, most of his life's work to. Um, but then I also realized that like these things, they're standing here and other families have lived in them and lived whole lives in, you know. So I became also interested in the historical aspect of them. and. Um, the other dimension of this is that, um, I mean, I guess it, I'll say it here, I'm gonna publish a book in which I talk about this a little bit. I suffer from very serious depressions. Um, and um, I think when I was deciding what I wanted to devote my life's work to, I gravitated toward architecture in part because I thought they don't have any emotions like <laughs> meaningless <laughs> they're inert i don't have to think about mood i don't have to think about sadness i don't have to think about all the stuff that that had been dominating my life so much so it's kind of ironic that like 20 years later i write this book that's all about emotions in the built environment <laughs> and it's something that i'm really interested in <laughs> Um, changed my mind. I actually think that, I mean, I often say in my lectures, there is no such thing as a neutral experience in the built okay. environment. There okay. is no such thing as a neutral design. I actually think that, um, that it affects people's moods and affects and decision-making processes and everything a lot. 
Um, and it's not that I didn't know that then, it was more like I didn't have to deal with the complexity because the other thing I was really interested in was literature. Okay. Um, and so I didn't have to deal with the complexity of another person's emotional life. Yeah, it was if I worked on architecture. It was enough for you. No, but just say one thing. Because um, someone, a friend of mine who's a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist actually just recently read the book and um, he said, you know, the question I have for you is if you talk about priming, which I think is so important for architects to think about and for us all to think about, if you talk about the built environment as priming you, like, how, what are the selection principles your mind uses? Um, you know, non-consciously. Yeah. Uh, because you have all this stuff around you. So what non-consciously is my mind, you know, grabbing onto and whatnot? And his, his hypothesis was that whatever mood you're in, you grab onto those things that reinforce it. I'm not sure, sure that's true. I mean, none of us know, right? But it's interesting to think. About. It's really interesting. I, again, you know, like in an unconscious level uh, of the mind, we have we have a lot. Like when when particularly me, when I see terracotta floors, I am extremely happy. People tell me this is so ugly. What's wrong with you? There is very materials. I say for you, for me. It's a connection with my grandmother. It's happy experiences. It's Colombia. It's, uh, I feel it in my skin. I, 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 I have so much going on. Say every, but totally I agree, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. like that. So how did everything start in your career? Like what was... Um, well, two points, I would say. Um, I mean, a lot of points, but... The two in particular, one I'm, I talk about in the book, which is that for my graduation present, my parents give me, um, took me on a six week trip okay. uh, in Tuscany. I mean, basically between Florence and Rome, we yeah. went to all these little hill towns and so on. And um, mainly, I, I think in part because like none of us really got along very well. So like we spent all day long every day, like blue book in hand going on walking tour after walking tour after walking tour. So we had stuff to do. So it was just like crammed with art and architecture all the time. And, um, you know, funnily enough, it was walking into San Vitale in Ravenna. I don't know if you know that church. It's like a Romanesque. No. It's like an early Christian to Romanesque church. It's incredibly dark. It's octagonal. Um, it has like these beautiful arches where light just kind of blazes in. And I was the only person in there. Uh, and again, it was sort of, it was a little bit like an awe experience and saying, I mean, it's a much smaller scale than a harvest moon, but um, I just noticed there was an, there was a sense of order. Okay. Human industry and creation and beauty that was so optimistic. Uh, and that I just, I, so it's the first time I began to like realize buildings, or one of the early times I began to realize buildings did that. Um, then I became like a little bit obsessed and right after college I moved to New York City and I didn't really know anybody and so I did what we'd done on this trip. I bought a whole slew of guidebooks and um, every week I, Saturdays and Sundays, I'd take myself on walking tours because um, there were two different walking tours. And, um, and I was kind of obsessed, like maybe annoyingly obsessive about it. Um, like I had to know. You were academically obsessed. You were doing what and, you just graduated. Yeah, you know? a little bit. Yeah. And um, 
So I continue to have like this incredibly robust cognitive map of Manhattan um, that just orients me. It's like the center of my world. It will always be the center of my world. Well, San Vitale. Okay, I'm in New York City. Okay, and then right. mentorship. I mean, mentorship is really important. Yeah. In, um, in college, you know, I mean, kind of like you with me and Johanny Palazma. Yeah. Like, I found two people in college that just, I got what they were saying, and they got me. And, Resonate. you know, and they, they sort of took me under their wing a little bit. Um, so, and that made me feel like, like this was something I could do. I feel like there is a lot of resistance in the field within architecture design about neuroarchitecture and psychology. <sighs> it's, I get frustrated. I get uh, people who tell me, what are you doing? Nobody's interested in your topics. topics. Nobody cares about, architects don't care about this. I say, I don't care if they don't care. I do care. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. Well, not only I'm sorry, but they should care. Super arrogant mm -hmm. not to care. And when I talk to you, honey, we, we agree on something. Don't you think this lack of empathy is pure arrogance? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I took out the Latino out of him, you know, like pushing, pushing. <laughs> Um, look, you're, I don't know if you're going to get me to say these things on tape. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> we're going to remove, don't worry, if you want to. Remove. Oh my God, it's just unbelievable, the arrogance. Um, and it, you know, it's, I have come, like I've thought a lot about this because like I taught in architecture schools for 15 years. I kept asking these questions and everybody kept looking at me like, you stupid idiot. Like, you know, why are you asking? This is just irrelevant. And I, I thought, no, it's not. We actually know things about this. We can say things about this. And we're talking about the people who are going to be using your buildings. So this is not stupid. Um, like, but I, I've, there are a lot of reasons why architects uh, seem so impervious uh, to this material. A lot of institutional reasons, historical reasons, uh, reasons having to do with the way architecture is taught um, that I now understand. I don't think it's a lack of empathy. Um, I think it's um, feeling overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that they're being asked to master, which is objectively overwhelming. Correct. Um, they're not being a formal discipline that they can turn to, to kind of educate themselves really quickly because it's only just now emerging. Yeah. Uh, and cultural relativism and identity politics, I think is a big part of it. Um, I'm all for cultural relativism. I'm all for the importance of identity and so on. But I think that some of the resistance is political. It's like you can't make generalizations about people that way because that's somehow politically suspect. Um, oh, beyond frustrating. Yeah. Now let's jump to this question that I had for the end, but I think it suits now. Do you think the pandemic? the COVID-19, the stay home uh, rules uh, is going to help people understand that we need to improve our spaces because most of the people are hating their spaces when they were in confinement. It's a lack of something. Do you think this is a time? I think, I think the pandemic helps. Um, I, what is it? I, I, I mean, I think there, there are also more and more people, and you're going to join us, who
who are just like jumping up and down and saying, you guys can't ignore this anymore. Um, that, you know, um, look, a change moves very slowly. Uh, and I mean, sometimes change moves very rapidly. And I do think that the pandemic has helped to accelerate that. I think you're right. Um, I think that's part of it. But change on an institutional level happens very slowly. Um, and I actually think, and I say this repeatedly, that younger people, I don't know how old you are, but you're certainly young, a lot younger than I am, um, that younger people are going to carry the banner. Um, that it's like doing the same old thing without regard to people's wellness, health, cognitive experience, developmental experience is just not going to cut it for the younger generation. Um, I mean, our generation, like, it was embarrassing to talk about wealth, about, about wellness. I mean, you just, you know, it was all about achievement and what you could do for society and so on and so forth. But, you know, people in your generation, people in my kids' generation, like, they're like, screw that. I mean, I, you know, I've got one life. I'm going to make sure <laughs> that, <laughs> that I'm doing something that really matters. And, um, and I think that's going to help. And I think there are just more and more people making noise uh, that this really is important to such an extent that it's going to be a little bit embarrassing to continue to ignore it for the architecture profession. And I'll tell you, I have a little bit of experience with this because I'm old enough to have seen what happened with sustainability, which is like in the beginning, people were very resistant okay. to embracing sustainability they're like oh the architects who do it they're so bad and it's so stupid and how can we really measure this stuff anyway and so and so forth this is when i was first got to harvard and then we i was on the admissions committee we kept getting more and more applications of students saying this is really important and i need to study it and that's why i want to come to harvard and finally, the people realized, the senior faculty thought, hmm, maybe we should hire someone who does sustainability. Do you think, Sara, do you think a good design could produce any outcome on terms of behavior? Oh, of course. I mean, we, that's obvious. I have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Look, in terms of behavior is actually one of the easiest things to talk about and to measure because he's in the 1960s. Can you repeat the name? Roger Barker, B-A-R-K-E-R. -E yeah. I would uh, and he, he did a ton of work in the 1950s and the 1960s. And he, actually, he's mentioned in my book, but there are, you should just go and read his book, um, in which he showed they basically set up a research station in this tiny little midwestern town and all of his they were all psychologists and these research psychologists like followed kids around all day long and took notes on what they were doing like johnny went and got a soda and johnny did this and johnny did that and he published a lot of work showing just how much behavior was constrained inflected determined by the by the environments these people were in um, and it's it's a strain of environmental psychology that's uh less well followed than other strains but incredibly important um, and there's another there's also a book which you might be interested in called choice architecture um, it's written by a woman who's an environmental psychologist and her husband, who's an economist. Um, and it basically applies the principles of behavioral economics. And there is a book of behavioral exactly. economics. 
that um, I, I I read and um, they were explaining this. You've read that book? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. From it's MIT. really interesting. Guys from the MIT, right? That's yeah. right. If you just read the basic premises of behavioral economics, you realize that obviously we can do these kinds of things with the environment too. Um, I mean, there are even these kind of simple and maybe even a little bit stupid studies that that compare the difference between how people occupy rooms of the same square footage with different geometric footprints. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious, but if a room is shaped like that, people are gonna congregate in the corners and not really interact with one another too much because if they're here, like they're too close to each other. And anyway, but if you take the same square footage like that, you're gonna get a, a group interaction. Um, and um, I, I wish I knew the, the citation to that study, but it's, it's probably pretty easy to find. Anyway, so totally. Um, and that isn't to say every single person will occupy these spaces in the way that a designer intends. But, you know, we're talking about probabilities here. You increase the probabilities that children will learn better by doing X, Y, and Z. That doesn't mean that the outcomes are guaranteed, but, you know, it's, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Exactly. And, and to do perhaps designs that will help people with disabilities or that need the design to help them thrive, you know? Of course. Yes, of course. The, the, like, how do you think, um, how enriching environments should be created for the aim to grow better brains and have better lives? Um, I have to go back and look at the literature on enriched environments that has been published since my book, because it's been a few years. But, you know, I love this concept of enriched environments. And it's, it's so intuitively correct. I mean, if you think that if you think that anything or the basic premises in my book are correct, that people are primed by things that, um, you know, without even really realizing it, that affordances communicate certain things in environments, then the concept of enriched environments makes certain sense, which it just, it kind of sparks you to imagine you, interacting with these spaces, interacting with other people in these spaces in a wider variety of ways. Um, and so it's sort of obvious that you're gonna grow bigger brains by, by more imagining, by more creative ways of thinking and so on. And, you know, so, but you have to balance that with people's need for order uh, and, and pattern, which is, you know, enriched environment doesn't just mean throwing a whole lot of stuff at people. It's, you have to do it very carefully. You have to about, think about sequence, timing, what kinds of stimuli, you know, different kinds of emotional tenors. There isn't just one enriched environment. It depends on a lot of different factors. Yeah, because uh all these elements, maybe correct me if I am wrong. We need all these elements because we don't like to get bored. The brain doesn't like to be bored. It's like painful for the brain to be bored. So all these could be more yeah. happier and more engaged. And I think what you say about boredom, I read about it in the book. I mean, I think that's when you live in Germany now. So maybe you really appreciate this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to ask you this. Do you think there is a way, okay, for architecture to start thinking more about this? You know, like we enter the space and the space enters us. How, how can we explain this in a basic, rough uh, way to, to architecture? I think, well, here's what I do yeah. in my own lectures, which is, I start by giving a bunch of examples mm -hmm. of, of things that, that make people's jaws drop. 
basically. For, example, for instance. So, for example, the clipboard experiment, which I think I talk about in the book, but I might not. I mean, the, I've used that a lot. Um, the clipboard experiment and the education are two examples that I use a lot. Okay, so the clipboard experiment is very simple, which is that there's this Yale psychologist uh, who um, got a bunch of students together as research subjects and basically said, pretend that you're like a, a human resources person, you need to hire someone. Uh, and so here are 10 resumes and you need to evaluate them. Um, and he handed out clipboards with all the resumes on it. Um, and what he didn't tell the research subjects is that half the clipboards were like these really light flimsy things and the other half of the clipboards were these really heavy substantive ones and when he looked at how the resumes had been rating he realized that people who were holding the heavier clipboards rated their the people in the, in their resumes as of higher competence and more substance. Okay, so there's an instance in which an environmental clue cue has primed people to make a social judgment. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's the kind of thing, like every time I tell that story, people go, what? Like, how is that even possible? Um, and there's some, contra these results from this branch of psychology are somewhat controversial, so, then I always also like to give the other experiment, which is the school experiment, school study that I cite in the book, where they, you know, better designed classrooms produced measurably better learning in students. In, in a, you know, in a pretty rigorously controlled study, I think it was in Germany, actually. And so, you know, and then the healing, you know, the Roger Ulrich he healing yeah. thing. And the window. Right, and so you think, think better and differently, learn better and differently, heal better and differently. Like, that's not what you think when you usually think of design, is it? No, you think about aesthetics. Right, and there's nothing wrong with aesthetics. I'm a big one for aesthetics, but aesthetics just means something different when you realize the profound impact that it can be having on people. I mean, I often say like, the way your kids learn, the way your grandmother heals, uh, the way you, you know, the kind of job you get, like those are pretty big things. And if they're being influenced by environmental cues, we should have better control of that. Yeah. So I don't know if that helps, but that's the way I do it. Do you think this is like a call for all the architects and designers to roll, to roll their sleeves and start working for a better world by introducing all this into their lives, you know, like let's study. I mean, I don't think it's such a bad thing to read, to, to, to educate ourselves for a better world. Look, <laughs> that's why I wrote my book. Can you tell me about your book, Welcome to Your World? Um, what you want me to summarize it or just, well, I wrote it in part because, look, I was very interested in phenomenology and particularly in Merleau Ponty and William James. And, um, and I kept trying to sort of bring these interests to architects and, um, you know, they were a little bit like, we can't really talk about that. We can't make these generalizations. It's everybody, you know, it's too culturally specific, this and this and that. And I, I could never have written that book, quite frankly, if I stayed at Harvard. Um, because uh, there was a lot of resistance uh, about these ideas. But, you know, I was lucky enough to be in a position where I could do whatever I wanted. Um, and... <laughs> and <laughs> And, um, and, and when the cognitive neuroscientific studies started coming out, substantiating the precepts of embodied cognition, I thought, okay, enough. Like we have 
information now. This is not just another theory, this is actually the facts about the way the mind works. And I'm tired of having these discussions, so I'm just gonna like write it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's a simplification because I did a, a ton of research for that book. I can um, imagine. I, and you love Can as well, uh, Louise Can, mm -hmm. which I love too. Well, I mean, it's funny because uh, even though the Khan book was a historical book, um, a lot of the reasons I was drawn to Khan mm -hmm. is because he was in Italy like you, and he got inspired in Italy like you, in Umbria. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it helped me to realize more about why Khan's work is so effective. Mm -hmm. um, and that I wasn't, Again, it wasn't just like, oh, I love this kind of work because I love this kind of work. No, I love this kind of work because he's dealing with the psychology, with the psychological and cognitive aspects in a way, and he's just figured it out. Um, like what he says about natural light. I mean, once you know that the brain hates to be bored, you know, circadian rhythms, once you know all of this psychological, physiological stuff, and you go back and you read what Khan said about natural light, it just blows your mind. It's like, man, he just got it. Um, so, you know, we, uh, what I should, what I will say to you is that we should hope that our research is never done. Uh, because um, we need so much more information about this it's really is the beginning of it yeah um yeah well i'm working on a bunch of different things but uh, the um the thing that's foremost on my plate right now related to this is um do you, you know sarah robinson's work yeah Okay, so Sarah Robinson and I are doing two things. The first thing is we're going to make a video presenting some of these ideas to young people that will almost certainly be sponsored by the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, um, and is, is also sponsored by ANFA, the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture, um, because we share your frustration and um you know so much content now is received by younger people through through videos um and we think we can make a really compelling video and actually we've gotten a director who is very committed to trying to figure out a way to shoot this video in ways that conveys the experience of being in spaces which a lot of programs and, and films about architecture don't really do very well. Wow, that's fantastic. So we're doing that and then the idea is that um, following up on that we're actually going to develop a course uh, an, um, because it's needed. It is. Yeah. No, so not. that's what I'm working on. I'm so happy and, and to add, you know, th there is a word that we use a lot in psychology, which is psychosomatic health, you know. So working mm -hmm. to create spaces or to learn how to create spaces that are beneficial for our psychosomatic health, you know, and that will improve our, like this term, uh, German term, Stimmung, which is mm -hmm. our mood to create atmospheres will be like the ultimate goal of this course, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's and to give people the tools to understand um, what's important and what a procedure would look like to actually design such things. Okay, thank you, Sarah. I want to say thank you so much for your time. I'd like to ask- well, It's a pleasure you. to meet you. It is a pleasure to meet you and I 